So today is Saturday, May 13th, 2017. Uh, today in our case show, we will visit an old friend. As always, when I uh, look at a case show or either a Cohen or a Jataka that we've looked at before, uh, I've revised it a bit. Uh, and I like doing that uh, because I find uh, I've never understood enough. So we'll look today at the uh, Brave Parrot Jataka. Uh, and let me kind of retell it for you, and then we'll look at it in terms of practice. Once the Buddha was a little gray parrot. One day clouds gathered over her forest home. Lightning flashed, thunder crashed, and a dead tree, struck by lightning, burst into flames. The wind began to blow, and sparks leapt from tree to tree. The whole forest began to burn. Fire, called the parrot, smelling the smoke. Fire, run to the river. Flapping her wings, she flew toward the safety of the river's other shore. She was a bird and could fly away. But as she flew, she saw below her many of the forest's great trees wreathed in flames. She saw uh, animals trapped by fire with no way of escape. Suddenly a desperate idea, a way to save them, came to her. Darting to the river, she called to the animals already gathered there. Elephants, fill your trunks with water to spray on the flames. The rest of us can carry water in cupped leaves. Working together, there's a chance we can save our forest home and our friends. But the animals huddled on the shore moaned, it's too late. There's nothing anyone can do, little parrot. It's true coughed the cheetah. Fast as I am, flames are faster. And powerful as we are, trumpeted the elephants. We can't charge through fire. It's hopeless, the animals agreed. But the little parrot saw a way. Soaking her feathers in the river and filling a cupped leaf with water, she flew back over the burning forest. Flames leapt at her. Fierce heat struck. Thick smoke coiled. Walls of fire shot up, now on one side, now on the other. Twisting and turning through that mad maze of fire, the little parrot flew on. At last, over the heart of the burning forest, she shook her wings. The few drops of water that still clung to her feathers tumbled glittering like jewels into the fire. She poured the water from her leaf cup. The water vanished with a hiss. Then the little parrot flew back to the river, drip, dipped her body and wings in the water, and filled another leaf cup. Stay with us, little parrot, pleaded the gentle deer. Don't go back over that fire. Yes, stay, roared the mighty tiger. A few drops of water can't save a burning forest. It's too late, cried all the animals. Stay and be safe here with us, here on the river's other shore. But it might still be possible, panted the little parrot. So I'll try. And once again, she flew back over the burning forest, shook her wings, poured the water from her cup, and let those few glittering drops fall. Hiss! Back and forth, the little parrot flew. From the river to the forest, from the forest to the river. Her eyes grew red as coals. Her feathers became charred. Her claws cracked from the heat. She coughed and choked. But still, the little parrot flew bravely on. At this time, some of the carefree goddesses and gods happened to be drifting by high overhead, laughing and talking in their palace of sunlit clouds. They were eating honeyed foods and sipping sweet wines. One of them, looking down, saw the little parrot flying over the burning forest far below. Look at that foolish bird, he exclaimed trying to put out a raging forest fire with a few sprinkles of water? 
Ridiculous, snorted another god. Impossible, laughed a goddess. Can't she see it won't work, exclaimed the first god. Putting down his golden bowl and silver cup, he transformed himself into a golden eagle, flapping his broad wings once, twice, three times. He leapt from the cloud palace down towards the little parrot. As the little parrot flew towards the center of the forest's fiery heart, the eagle appeared at her side. Turn back, little bird, said the eagle in a commanding voice. A few drops of water can't save a forest. Turn back now and save yourself before it's too late. Great Eagle coughed the little parrot. Why give such pointless advice? Everybody already knows about saving themselves. If you really want to be of use, find a way to help. And on she flew. The great eagle was stunned. The heat was fierce. He flapped his great wings and rose up, up to the cooler air high above. Far below him now he saw the little parrot still flying bravely on. High above him he saw his fellow gods and goddesses laughing and talking, eating and drinking as the forest burned. And many animals cried out in pain and fear below. Then for the first time in his nearly endless life, that god felt ashamed. We are gods after all, he exclaimed. We should do something. Overcome by new emotions, the eagle began to weep. Tears fell from his eyes in torrents, sheet after sheet, like cooling rain upon the fire, upon the forest, upon the animals, and upon the brave little parrot. Because those were the tears of a god, wherever those tears fell, the flames went out. Tears dripped from burnt branches and soaked into scorched earth. Wherever they touched, new life burst forth. Green grass pushed up from among still glowing cinders. Blossoms opened, leaves unfurled. New feathers grew on the little parrot, too. Feathers red as flame, green as leaves yellow as sunlight, blue as a river. Such perfect colors, such a pretty bird. The fire is out, called the little parrot in her joy. Look, our danger is past. The animals looked at one another in amazement. Washed by the tears, they were whole and well. Not one was harmed. Hooray, cried the animals. Hooray for the brave little parrot and for this sudden miraculous rain. Overhead, in a clear blue sky, they saw their friend, the little parrot, looping and soaring in delight. She had done all she could, and somehow it had saved them. So that's the story of the uh, brave little parrot that was adapted by myself from a book of mine, The Brave Little Parrot, uh, which was published by G.P. Putnam Sons in 1998, uh, currently out of print. Uh, Susan Gaber was the illustrator. So, the brave parrot Jataka, the story of a happy bird. The brave parrot Jataka embodies uh, our great vow to free all beings from the endless sufferings of delusion. This vow, which specifically says all beings, then includes liberating rivers, mountains, forests, oceans, animals as well as fellow humans from the effects of our own personal self-centeredness, as well as from the effects of various exploitive social, economic, and political systems. This is the first of our great vows for all. The three remaining vows show us how to make our first vow real. With the second vow, we commit to letting go, seeing through, or uprooting habitual attachments to the dualistic, self-centered greed, anger, and ignorance arising in our own minds. Our third vow is to fully accept that everything we encounter, difficulties included, is a potential Dharma gate, 
an opportunity for further maturity and deepening intimacy. A monk once asked, how can I enter Zen? The teacher replied, do you hear the stream flowing nearby? Yes, said the monk. Enter there, said the teacher. The fourth vow is to undertake the impossible task of fully embodying, of making real and living the ungraspable, selfless way of the Buddha. To fulfill these great vows, great because they are selfless and so beyond all limitation and narrowness, we attend to this count, this breath, this koan, this question, this life situation, this challenge, this precept, this error. As Wu Men says in The Gateless Barrier, if you want to know true gold, it can only be known in the midst of fire. Our life is fire. What is the fuel? The little parrot is at a crossroads. She can save herself. But is that enough? At the beginning of the story, she is happy to have the gift of flight. She is even happier at the end having used her gift to help others. She loops and soars because her great vow has become that much more real. We may find that we're happy to sit silently in Zazen. Is that enough? We may in time find that we can add to that and are even happier when our practice works freely, wisely, compassionately, spontaneously, selflessly, not just in the zendo or in the doksan room, but in the actualities of our life, when it is in how we interact with others, how we lift a spoon, how we look out the window. But we can falter, hold our vow at arm's length and think, well, one day I'll understand that, or when I'm enlightened, I'll do that. The second of our great vows shows us how to realize the first, not in some ideal future, but in the nitty gritty of right now. Greed, hatred, and ignorance arise endlessly. I vow to abandon them all. To free others, we must free ourselves now. As thoughts arise, it is not distant at all. If we are trapped in a well, we can't help anyone else until we get ourselves out or get out ourselves. We must do the work to make our aspiration real. Greed, hatred, and ignorance arise in our minds. If we build a self on them, we're trapped. If we don't identify with them, don't make our nest there, don't create a self from them, then all such self-centered thoughts can come and go like the wind that momentarily rattles the branches and is gone. How do we not attach to them? We don't fight them. That will only make them feel more real. We don't self-consciously try to stop them. That, too, only reifies them, creating a kind of isolating, hopeless effort. Instead, we attend to this count, this breath in the midst of them. We question the koan even as thoughts arise and fade. Of course, if thoughts are particularly troubling or rooted, we can hold to the breath like someone holding to the tiller of a boat in a storm. In all cases, we do our best to accept our impermanence nakedly, directly, freely. In this way, we simultaneously free others from what we no longer project onto them. To be free of ourselves is to free others from ourselves from having to bear and bear with our own self-centered needs, desires, expectations. To free others is, at the same time, to diminish our 
habitual fascination with the experience of isolated egotism. The two go hand in hand. Our work, the work of practice realization, is intimate, not distant. It's not just about reciting great vows for all as a closing ritual to periods of zazen. Each day we must do our best to actually live them breath by breath, minute by minute. Our challenge is always about how to make it real. Each day we dip in the river and fly back with a few drops of water for our burning world. Each day we practice the realization of this moment and realize this never-to-be-repeated moment of practice. The parrot Jataka does not appear in either the Pali Jataka or the Sanskrit Jataka Mala, though Jataka number 35 in the Pali collection of 547 about a quail who stops a forest fire with an act of truth is seen as a variant. An original may exist as a carving at the Buddhist monument of Borobudur as well as a painting at the Ajanta Caves. Whether it's text or visual art, the original ending is different. In the original, a god doesn't burst into tears, but squeezes a cloud to make rain fall. I created the god's tears more than 40 years ago when I began telling the story. The color of the parrot's feathers isn't mentioned in the original either. Are they gray, multicolored? Never mind. Deeds make us who we are. Selfless deeds make us beautiful. There is truth greater than fact. Myth reveals what never was but always is. Fact recounts what happens in one time and place. Myth reveals the archetype, what happens in all times, all places. Literalists hewing to facts alone can then still create a false story. It was my decision to make the parrot female. Is she in the original? No, he is not. Does that make our version untrue? Stories must speak to every generation or they fade. The feminine is reawakening. The Jatakas are often quite patriarchal. There are wise women, enlightened nuns, true wives and queens, but rarely, if ever, does the Buddha appear as female. Maybe this is how karma wor works. A man is a man is a man. Or maybe Buddhist monasticism suppressed a greater truth. In the Jatakas, the Buddha could be a crow, a dog, a monkey, but never a woman? Really? I felt it was time to give our grand old tradition a nudge. Hence the emergence from its overly literal shell of our brave lady parrot. Dogen writes in Receiving the Marrow by Bowing in Shobogenzo section 9, Why are men special? Emptiness is emptiness. Four great elements are four great elements. Five skandhas are five skandhas. Women are just like that. Both men and women attain the way. You should honor attainment of the way. Do not discriminate between men and women. This is the most wondrous principle of the Buddha way. Finally, there are no cheetahs, elephants, or tigers. I created them for a picture book version some years back. I liked them, and they liked the story, so they stayed. The cheetah's gift is speed, the elephant's strength, the deer's gentleness, the tiger's power. The point is that the parrot is not the fastest, strongest, gentlest, or mightiest. The race, as they say, is not always to the swiftest. The parrot's gift is to fly. From above she gains an encompassing view. Looking down from on high, she can see how bad things really are. Expanded vision, not just rapid travel, may be the real gift of flight with that first iconic photo of the earth from space, we all became little parrots. We saw the big picture. Let's not underestimate the gift. 
we also each have an original gift. Buddhist teaching says that just as we are, we are each, even a dog, Buddha. We will not gain it, become it, become more it, or lose it. But what is it? And why don't we know it? We may know shame, guilt, fear, inadequacy. We may get caught by an overly confident ego or tripped up by an overly self-critical defensive one. They are a pair. Yet either can become the irritating grit under the hard shell of our ego oyster that may in time produce a pearl. Why? 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 Why don't we know who or what we are? How? 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 How are we just as we are, stuck and limited as we are Buddhas? This irritation works on us without cease. If we accept the practice it demands, it can be a gift. The little parrot is a happy bird. How can we be happy birds? Should we ignore difficulties, sorrows, conflicts, issues? Should we put on rose-colored glasses? Should we shrug and say, well, that's karma, and accept whatever happens? The little parrot doesn't think so. She smells smoke and responds, crying, fire, fire, run to the river. And flapping her wings, she flies away. Right, right, as the old teachers say. If you can be free of danger, do it. Get free. Don't sit there moaning over your sad state, rehearsing what-ifs. If you can do something to respond in a useful way, do it. But let's accept, too, that being present in some situations is also going to mean get out of there. The Buddha does that in the wise quail, Jataka, when quarreling puts his flock at risk. Being awake in our lives and in our practice means respond. There are many ways to respond. It all depends on where that response comes from. It is said in a sutra, virtuous deeds are virtuous because they are not mine. That's from Transmission 24, Denkoroku, Transmission of Light. Kaplo <clears throat> Roshi used to say that being a Buddhist doesn't mean acting like a Buddha, sitting there with a half smile on your face. If you're at a party, sitting with legs folded in lotus posture, looking wise and kind, Roshi would say, get up and dance, try the hors d'oeuvres, talk to people. In short, respond to time, place, and circumstance. When sad things happen, we're going to cry. When joyous things happen, we'll laugh. When infuriating things happen, we'll even get angry. Selflessness doesn't mean we're zombies or robots. We get hungry and gratefully eat, tired and wonderfully sleep. When it's cold, we put on a jacket. When it's hot, we turn on a fan. When the food is good, we say, could I please have some more? But even getting up and dancing at a party can become rote. Zenny, no longer authentic. Knowing there is always more on the Dharma path, that wherever we are is both it and simultaneously, not yet enough, allows for continuous practice. What Zen master Dogen called sustained exertion, the exertion of the Buddha to be in the Jatakas. Zen master Dogen says that letting the 10,000 things be us, confirm us, and take their place as us, enlightens us, allowing us to be intimate. We no longer live dualistically with me in here and everyone and everything else out there. Master Dogen adds, when we push forward with the self to become one with the 10,000 things, it is called delusion. When the 10,000 things step in and illumine us, it is called intimacy or enlightenment. But let's be clear. 
we don't get something called enlightenment. Rather, we momentarily release our habitual self-centeredness and refined our original intimacy with bugs, clouds, people, cars, trash, crows. We find we are not selfless. We find we find we are not separate and alone, and never have been. Yet because we so often feel that we are, that is that we are separate and alone, not only do we fail to respond to our own real needs, we fail to respond to our burning forest. Indeed, sometimes we even light new and terribly destructive fires ourselves. The compassion that arises from intimacy isn't sentiment. It's action. Samanta Bahadra Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva of selfless activity, rides an elephant. Nothing can stop him or her on such a determined, steady mount. It is our nature to be brave parrots. It is our nature to see possibilities and act on them. Dogen adds that to study the self is to forget the self. This path is not one of gaining new Buddhist beliefs, but of going deeper into the nature of what we already are. We are not saved by gaining a better, more Buddhist self, nor do we get rid of ourselves but by losing a compulsive, self-centered involvement with ourselves, we find ourselves, our real selves, this count, this koan, this breath, this round of zazen is our entrance onto the ancient way. The little parrot can fly over the river and be safe, but what of others? What of trees and animals already surrounded by flames? When the Bodhisattva was a banyan deer, that thought, what of others, kept him from claiming personal freedom. He was tested again and again. Leave? No, I can't. Not until the other herd is free. Leave? No, I can't. Not until all animals are free. Leave? Not till birds and fish, too, are safe. Only then can I be free. In the hungry tigress? The Bodhisattva might have walked past the starving tigress and her cubs, only he couldn't. As a hare, the Bodhisattva saw a beggar, and a response, in response to his plea for food, leapt into the flames to become food. He couldn't walk by. Neither can the Bodhisattva, as a little parrot, fly to a place of personal safety, though she's just a bird. She sees a way to help. From up high, she sees how everything, trees, river, mountains, the great earth, are connected. She sees the forest as herself. When the mind of the Bodhisattva is awakened, seeing is doing. <clears throat> the ancient grit of me and my that stands like a veil between us, between, uh, really between our seeing and doing between us and everything is gone, gone, entirely gone, as the heart of perfect wisdom, Prajna Paramita Rodaya says. Bodhisattvas don't make escaping the point of their practice. They live in the middle of the stream, flying daily over the burning forest, dipping into the cool waters of emptiness. They don't give up. And they don't settle down saying, okay, that's enough. I'll build my comfy nest here. Every day they bring what they can, a little talent, a little insight, a little water, a few words, a helping hand. As few and as tiny as those drops are, how each sparkles, how cool and refreshing. And then psh, it too is gone. Yet, says this old story, if we keep going, 
keep flying, keep practicing, things that logic could never predict can happen. Who is the Bodhisattva? Is this just a story of Shakyamuni's own personal route to Buddhahood? Oh, look again. The beauty of Zen lies in this question. Who? Our world is burning. Trees, animals, ecosystems, and social safety nets are being engulfed. It is not an old tale. We are not simply inspecting our navels, trying to calm our own considerable distress. Our world is on fire. And the causes are exactly as the Buddha said 2,500 years ago. Greed, anger, and ignorance of our own nature. Brave parrots, if you love your forest, flap your wings. Find a way to the river and do not give up. When the chips are down and the last hand has been played, sometimes the inexplicable occurs. A light never seen on land or sea shines. A god descends. Clouds burst. Tears fall. And suddenly everything is whole and well. For a moment, we become what we are, have always truly been, and then we can really get to work.